Hi, Jason. This is David Ardley from Switzerland. Looking forward to your next Design Cast. Hello, I'm JD, and I listen to Design Cast from Qingdao, China. Hi, I'm Linda, and I listen to Design Cast from Milwaukee. Hello and welcome to DesignCast, a podcast where I interview a wide range of excellent guests in design and STEAM education to get their unique perspectives. My name is Jason Regan and I use my 20 plus years of experience as a design educator to dig deep into complex issues. This podcast has one simple mission, to create a community of people around the world that are interested in design and STEAM education. Each episode, I chat with guests from all corners of the design world, from classroom teachers to authors and even to educational consultants. We discuss a wide range of topics that we feel are relevant today. I do want to ask you that if you're enjoying this podcast, please leave a review, rate, subscribe, share, or download from your favorite podcasting app. This helps the podcast get discovered by listeners that might not find it otherwise. Also, it helps me to continually define the direction of future guests and episodes. Feel free to drop by my website, www.jasonreagan.ga, to leave me a comment or to sign up to be considered as a future guest on future episodes. Also, don't forget to stop by Anchor and leave me a voice clip that could even end up in an upcoming show. Thanks for listening. So let's get to it. Welcome back to another edition of DesignCast. I am so pleased that you're here spending your time with me. So I do appreciate that. And I hope that you're still enjoying and continue to enjoy the content that I've been helping to create. On this episode of DesignCast, I had the fantastic opportunity to chat with Aidan Hammond, who is the current head of design at Branksome Hall Asia in Jeju, South Korea. We had a great discussion about command terms, working during the lockdown, and circular design. I am confident that you will really enjoy this episode. On a different note, please subscribe, rate, and share this podcast. I appreciate all of the support that I've been getting, and I will continue to do this as long as people want it. So thank you so much. If you have any ideas for future episodes or would like to be a guest, please reach out through my website, www.jasonreagan.ga. And there's a contact form right there on the website, and the link is in the show notes. If typing isn't really your thing, you can leave me a voice message, which is just so much fun to get. So please feel free to leave me a voice message. That link is also in the show notes. And finally, for an expanded description of what we talk about in this episode, please check out the linked hyperdoc that's in the show notes. Wow, the show notes are pretty important, I guess. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode with Aiden. Hey guys, welcome back to another edition of Design Cast. And I am just absolutely over the moon with having Aiden Hammond. So, Aiden, uh, can you introduce yourself and tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, and how you kind of got into teaching? 
Uh, well, I got into teaching in a quite a roundabout way. I did an undergrad in uh, ceramics and then did a master's in uh, linguistics, applied linguistics, ended up in Korea in the early 2000s, teaching academic writing in the day and moonlighting as a ceramics teacher in the evening because I was one of the few people that was qualified to teach university students ceramics and English. And then a uh, long sort of journey ended back into teaching uh, kids, uh, moving away from teaching at university, which was a really good move for me. And and uh, now I'm a head of design at Branksome Hall Asia, where I'm the head of the MYP and the DP program. And uh, yeah, leading and working with a great team of people here and doing some really innovative stuff and excited to share and talk about it with you guys. Thanks, Aiden. I'm, I was really excited that you accepted the invitation to talk because I've been to your school and, and seen your students and yeah. seen your, you know, your colleagues and your, your setup there. And I think it's really important that we share all these great things. And you're a real inspiration of mine with lots of things you do. So I want to thank you personally for, <laughs> for being such a good inspiration. Oh, <laughs> for that. And so, and I, I assume that you're Canadian, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I actually grew up in uh, Zimbabwe and then ended up in Canada in the early 80s and then uh, moved abroad in the, in the 2000s. So, but carry a Canadian passport. <laughs> I gotcha. Very cool. Awesome. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the setup? Like the, what's the situation in Jeju? It's quite unique. And can you just give us a little bit of kind of just a quick overview of what your school setup is like. Yeah, so Branksome Hall Asia is one of four international schools on the island. And uh, we're literally all on one road, essentially. Uh, we're neighbors. It's kind of a little bit of a, little bit of a bubble that we're, we're in. There, we've got the schools and then around that we've got, uh, you know, the housing for the teachers and, the, and a lot of our families live within walking distance of the school. And then outside of that, it's just forest and, and beaches. So it really is kind of like a bubble. It's great to be so close to nature and, and, and have that. And then our school is an international girls school. We're the sister school of Branksome Hall uh, in Toronto, and we're a full IB continuum, so PYP, MYP, and DP. In the MYP, in the middle school and senior school, we've got a quite a big design program. It's a it's a mandatory core subject for the for the girls up until grade nine, and then we have about in any year it's between seventy five and eighty five percent of the grade tens will be in a design course. And this year we have our biggest DP design cohort. Uh, we've got 20 girls in grade 11 and 12 girls in grade 12. So it's a, it's a huge group that we've got. So it's a really exciting place to be right now with such, such interest. Do you want me to talk a little bit about the space or? Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. If you could tell yeah. a little bit about the space, because your buildings are quite unique. Their shapes and everything are They're pretty all unique. <laughs> They're all round. Yeah. Each of our, uh, our schools sort of set up like, um, I guess you could say like pods. I um, mean, that's what we refer to them at. And they're these round sort of three, four story cylinders. And our design department takes up the full floor of, of one, which the classrooms are sort of on the outside of the ring. And then we have this wonderful big open space that uh, over the years, we've really kind of worked to develop as a multi-purpose space. So our classes uh, can break out and we can do large projects. Um, we also have a lot of space outside the school. Um, I always joke that our school is actually the one that's got the most grass of all the four schools. So it's really easy to bring the girls out and do, do inquiry out there. And we also have a nice uh, indoor space where actually several large indoor spaces where we can gather and we do a lot of like large scale interdisciplinary units and, and uh, large scale inquiries and, and so on. And that's, I think, one of our greatest uh, assets as a design department is that we have access to all this space to do these big, big inquiries. That's awesome. And so last time I visited you guys, you had one classroom in your pod on that floor that was not a design classroom. I'm assuming by now you've overtaken that classroom. <laughs> no, uh, it's it's one of the uh, one of the holdouts. We have a it's technically it's an office, but it's used as a language ed classroom for the smaller language ed classes. So we've got to work really hard to keep the uh, the routers and the, the machines to, uh, the noise level a little bit down. So we we work really hard with. Uh, with our team to do that. Sometimes I have to buy the occasional bottle of wine to smooth things over with our colleague. Sounds like it's a building project ready to happen. You guys need to just yeah. build a shed outside <laughs> on the grass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. The running, the running joke before with the old business manager was whenever I put in a procurement request or for something facilities related, I think there was a couple I put in that got refused. And so we just went ahead and kind of built it ourselves. And then he, now at the bottom, he would write, and if he refused it, you know, he would write like, and don't build it yourself just to kind of clarify. So we're, we're a little more cautious now. Well, that's what design teachers do. Well, I'll just find a workaround. So, yeah. and recently, I would say recently in the last couple of years, you guys built like an outdoor kitchen or a pizza oven or something like yeah, that we've got a we've got a nice little pizza oven which we're actually looking forward to firing up this weekend for the first time we've got we're going to be able to sort of make it work within our social distancing covid measures and stuff so that's great we're right next to a sustainability garden you know we and actually one of our i'll talk a little bit later about that but agriculture and and sustainable production and manufacturing and stuff is a big thing and it's really nice to just have like food growing right out near our rooms and then a place to eat it as well we kind of make those connections that's so cool and i mean you guys have such a neat setup there with you know from grade six on it's all girls and there's a so you know lots of borders and and, and things like that. And so you have kind of a captive audience <laughs> because it's not anywhere yeah. they can really go. Yeah, yeah. One thing that's really impressive about your space is your enormous design library, reading materials yeah. and things like that. And tell me about kind of where you found resources and has it been pretty easy to find the things you need? Yeah, in terms of, in terms of building our library, that initiative came out of a literacy initiative at the school a few years ago where the school wanted um, each department to build up basically the philosophy being that like you know surrounding the kids with books and we had a very small a lot of sort of sort of technical manuals things like that technical dot books and so we we took that uh, initiative we took the money that came with it and we really kind of ran with that it's actually been one of the one of the things I'm, I'm really proud about about the department and that we have this incredible resource here it's it's open to the kids it's close uh, we work really closely with our with the school library but it's it's a different thing to have that you know in your in your classroom and to quickly and easily just go and grab it when you're having discussions with kids and go and get that resource and put it in their hands and we've done a few kind of learning engagements with them where you know we can kind of build up literacy skills through looking at you know books on material science for example with you know grade eights or grade nines and also just getting them sort of more fluent in the, the language and the culture of design I think when I've done workshops uh, with other design teachers, common point that comes up is that the subject sometimes isn't respected or valued as much, as much by like either the, the the parents or the students or the admin. And I, I think you know from an academic point of view, having having like a, an academic focus and having books that sort of validate the the subject and having those visible and around i think goes a long way to sort of saying this is a subject that people take seriously and that's certainly been something that parents and also students have remarked upon as well like they'll come in and not really think that there's connections between a product design and like chemistry and material science they don't really see that but they'll see it on the on the shelf and they'll, or a resource we put in their hands and that's you know sparking connections and stuff so i have library in every time I come and see your, your library. <laughs> We're trying to build one up too, but man, you've, you've put us to shame. So, but I appreciate all the help you've given me with finding resources and, yeah. and sharing those with us. And so I was just going to say, we've put up the whole collection on, on Goodreads. So you can, I think I shared that link with you and you can put it in the, the notes there or whatever, but you know, it's, it's there because it's, uh, we want everybody to have a library like that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. And what I was going to also ask about is I know you guys do a lot with IDUs and you have a really special one that you guys do where you involve your other, your sister campus sometimes. Yeah. Is that right? Still, could you yeah. tell us about that one? Yeah, sure. So for those that aren't familiar with um, what an IDU is within the, within IB MYP speak, it's, it's essentially uh, an interdisciplinary unit. So it's where teachers from usually two, but in our case, three subjects uh, get together and they, they plan a, a, a learning inquiry that draws upon knowledge from that with the goal being, and this is the real challenge is that it's not about just learning about the three things that, you know, in our case, it's uh, science, design, and math, but it's about using those three disciplines to sort of synthesize and uh, create something new. And that's really what we're trying to get with the, the girls to take this wide variety of knowledge and come to a new understanding, I guess. Um, so what we do in our case is our sister schools, their girls come over. Every year, it's the number varies, but combined with our girls, we're usually between 150 and 180 kids. They get uh, matched up into uh, small teams. And then we do an inquiry that 
in the early years was really just focused on building a wind turbine. Jeju is really famous for its wind. So in the early years, that was about just, you know, who can, which team can build the, the turbine that produces the most electricity. And it's kind of evolved from there more into uh, an inquiry into the efficacy of wind energy and whether governments and designers and engineers make these decisions what you know how do we measure whether those decisions are effective and in our case with the goal of reducing carbon emissions so the girls do that through building the wind turbine but there's uh, field trips to turbine farms we go to an island that's just off of jeju that has working to be carbon free by 2030 and so we look at this small little village the impact of all the, the the funding that's gone into that village to make it carbon free and how in some ways they are on the right track and in some ways they aren't you know you've got in, in that particular case on the island you know it's a fishing community everybody has diesel boats these fishermen don't get enough money to buy a boat that runs on batteries and there's not enough electricity generated by the wind turbine to you know charge the batteries so it's we get the kids to understand that that's a really complex problem it's not as it's not as simple as just sticking up a wind turbine and you know patting yourself on the shoulder and saying all right we've done let's go on to the next problem the fun part and the part i really love as a design teacher is the actual designing of the turbines we i think about four years ago we built a giant wind tunnel uh, it's about five six meters long it's powered by four gigantic fans the biggest fans the school let me buy every year for the first few years i kept asking for more money to buy bigger fans i mean i just sort of say enough those fans are big enough but it's great we have a we have a test chamber that's a meter cubed and so the kids can put in quite large turbines and uh, i think it's super super accurate data because uh, we've got a, just a consistent 4.8 uh, meters per second wind speed. We've designed it so that, and this was a great inquiry to do with the kids. It's been designed so that there's like a nice laminar flow, which is like there's no turbulence in the in the air where the where the measurement and where the turbines is. And it's huge and it's loud, and the students don't build their wind turbines very well, so they inevitably just explode. So um, every year we do it. There's there's always a an Instagram or YouTube channel that of like the best explosions and uh, and stuff. It's heartbreaking for the kids too. You know, it just spins. And and then one blade flies off and another one flies off. And, but it's super exciting. It's the most fun all, all year. Everybody is looking forward to it. Yeah, I always look forward to seeing that on you guys. You have a great departmental Instagram account or feed. And I love to, to keep up with you guys from that as it comes across as stories or whatever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's time for that. And I still plan to be there. It's on my bucket list to come to see your giant box fan uh, demonstration. <laughs> I really want to check that out. Yeah, I'd love to have you down. It's really fun. For anyone listening, if you're not familiar with the geography, it's about a 40 minutes to an hour, I guess. It's not That's that about far. An hour. Yeah. yeah. So it's a pretty easy, it's a domestic flight, just a quick, quick little hopper. It's neat to go over and see what they're doing. So what have been some of the challenges? Jeju, I've found, is quite isolated geographically. Is that in a challenge for you guys at all? Yeah, I think the, well, the geography is... We do a lot with the geography. I mean, it, in the case of the project I just mentioned, I mean that that's defined by the by the location. I think the the biggest challenge, and especially now under the, the new world that we're living, is that isolation. The girls really struggle, for example, for as design students to find users outside of their community because the community is so tight. And you know, we've got the school, and then we have the the families and the several small businesses around us. It's not like I always use the analogy of like, you know, a kid that's living in a bigger city and they they walk out of the front gates of the school and they're going to encounter a whole different kind of range of problems by people they don't know or things they observe on the street. And, and that's just a richness in that kind of sense that maybe most kids will not encounter here because of just the way the, the place is sort of set up. So that's often a challenge. Although we've, over the years, we still kind of figure out ways and, and actually one of the benefits of the school closure last year was the kids were back in their own communities, spending time with grandma, spending time with family, going to these stores under these really unusual conditions to, you know, get groceries and stuff. And they, to their credit, they were, or just, they were, had no problem finding these, these users. And some of the strongest work we got out of our grade tens were, you know, our girls actually working with the community, the people in their local community under these such unusual challenging conditions. And one girl was actually quite anxious to come back to school because she was in the middle of her inquiry. She spent all this time doing this user research. Now she had to come back to the island and 
she wasn't sure how she was going to connect with her user, you know, and, and stuff. And it, it was nice to see that she had that really strong connection with that inquiry and with that person and stuff. You're um, actually the second person I've heard say that in two days from a different, another school about how they were much more connected to the subject yeah. by not being at school. <laughs> Sorry yeah. to interrupt you, but yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's not something that we kind of expected to have. I actually thought there'd be a bigger challenge, but I was also credit to the kids too, right? Like they, they wanted to do their best in the subject and they wanted to really actually make it authentic for themselves without us really having to push them too hard for that. They were able to do it. So. That's really yeah. cool. And I want to ask you real quick too, because I really appreciate the work you've done with command terms for design. We've got some of your posters up. We make sure to give you credit, Aiden, I promise. But we have some of your posters up because your audience, I would say, mm -hmm. is similar to our audience as yeah. far as language and, and, and whatnot. So can you tell me a little bit about your posters and stuff that you've made for your command terms? Sure. So I guess I'll go back a little bit and talk about the maybe the impetus for that. So, so I'm a workshop leader. And one of the main complaints that I get from IB workshop leaders or IB work workshop participants is design is, MYP design is more about writing about design than it is about actually doing design. And the students also make the same complaint because they they feel like it's like a, such a huge burden. My, with my background in EAL and, and stuff, I've always been kind of conscious of, you know, when we ask a kid to write 200 words or two paragraphs in your second language. I mean, that's, I can speak Korean. I really struggle with that. That's not a five minute task. That is a lot of work. And it's even more work if I'm trying to achieve in the higher mark bands and stuff. So that was always kind of in the back of our mind. And then we did something which I highly recommend every single design department do, which is sit down with your team and sit down with your rubric and go through the command terms and make sure everybody understands what they mean. Because even in our own team and we were all experienced and we we're all confident MYP educators, we had different understandings of what those words meant. And if we didn't have that common understanding, our students certainly wouldn't have that. And so we actually spent, in terms of collaborative planning time, I would say maybe five to eight hours just as a team, just sitting down and just going through all the ones in the rubric. Doesn't sound really exciting, but it was really, they were really rewarding conversations because what you end up talking about is like, why do we ask the kids to do this? Like when we ask them to describe or justify, what's the purpose of that? And then you go to the next step, which is like, well, what does that look like? And then we went to what would be the minimum expectations for a seven? Because our challenge is that, and I just had two conversations today with, with students is that they just write so much because they're hoping that in that process of writing, that they'll hit all the points. They'll, they'll get everything that's supposed to be there. And so they're not really thinking as writers. They're just, it's just sort of the shotgun scatter approach of like, I'll just put everything in there. And I'm probably guessing many teachers have experienced that. Now our conversations are, and they're great with students like, what's the difference between describe and, ex and justify? Because the student will come up to us now and say, I thought I justified here, but you've put me in this mark band of five and six, which is just describe, but I don't understand. And then, so then your discussion is less about the writing and more about like, the act that you did, right? Like, well, where's your evidence for that? And where, how are you summarizing that evidence? And so our, our discussions are much better discussions, I think. We ended up translating them into Korean and Chinese, the terms, and we also, they're visible in the room. We really work hard, even in our, in our oral instruction to the kids to be, to really be explicit what we're asking them to do. So it just becomes a part of the language of design, I guess. We're just seeing huge paybacks in terms of the quality of the girls' writing. Also just you know, with, when it comes to assessment, if you've been really clear what a, what a describe is and what a justify is, then that discussion of like, why am I in the five, six mark band and not the seven, eight mark band? It isn't about, you know, did you mark my work right? But it's more about what do I need to do to get to this level? And what kind of thinking are you expecting me to show and, and things like that? And it's, that's a much more rewarding conversation, I think, for everybody. I mean, I'd rather talk about that with a kid than try to justify, you know, I'm three, four times your age. I don't want to, you know, justify my decision. That's a much better kind of conversation to have with kids. Yeah, I've done that with other design departments in the past. And I will say even among native English speakers, there's disagreement. So yeah. it definitely makes a big difference. And did you have trouble translating it? Or did they directly translate to Korean? Or how does that work? There were a couple of words like describe and explain, for example, where the dictionary terms were really, really similar.
point. We had to sort of define, sometimes when we're talking with the students, define it by what it isn't rather than what it is, which isn't my preference. I would rather define it in a, in a positive context, like these are the features rather than the lack of something, I guess. We didn't run into really any kind of challenges with that. A couple of our Chinese speaking colleagues helped us just proofread what we had done to make sure that we had the, we had the correct terms and such. Yeah, no, it wasn't, wasn't really, it's really a challenge. I think the biggest challenge of that whole process was just finding the time, sit down with your department and just meaningfully go through it. That was the challenge. It, it, it was five, five to eight hours, but that was over about three or four months where we, we just made it a priority in our department meetings to do that. But the conversations that came out of that process were hugely valuable. Like it just, you got to see how other teachers saw these steps, also how they thought about assessment. And then, then together as a department, just like align our thinking and stuff. And that was, I think, much better than like just only looking at student work and going, would you give it a seven? Would you give it a six? You know, that we've done that. But by far in, in the last few years, those conversations were the most valuable I think our department's ever had. That's fantastic. I think the way you guys have done that is, is really impressive. I know that we have a couple of colleagues in my own department who are Korean, Korean speakers and they're very very, very appreciative of having that there for them because it helped them describe it in English even better, you know, yeah. for our students. And so I really appreciate you guys taking that time. We we have benefited from your, <laughs> the way you've spent your time. So yeah, thank you so much for that. And so what is your vision for this design program? You've been there, what, seven years now? Yeah, this is my seventh year at Branksome Hall Asia. I've been really lucky, I guess, because when I came into the program, it was a new program and, you know, there's a lot of challenges with, with being at a new school as the school kind of figures out what it is. But I think I've benefited from that because I've been able to work with my team and, and actually every member of our team, I think, has been able to sort of participate in molding it or, or defining what it is. The thing that we're really interested in now and, and over the years we've been sort of moving away from is looking at reducing our, our environmental impact. Just when you walk out the door and you go to the beach and it's covered in plastic and you think, well, designers had a role in this. You know, when our students go to the cafeteria and come back with uh, single-use plastic containers and you think designer had a role in this, but as you as an individual may had a role in that as well. So we've been really looking at the materials that we use in the department as well as the, the technologies that we're exploring. Just be as ethical and sustainable as we can. Um, it's not easy. And I, I wouldn't say that we're a sustainable department, far from it. I would think we've taken steps in that direction and uh, we could probably do that more quickly if we had more time to do that. But some of the things we are doing, like I guess I'll talk about my our computer science grade 10 course. The physical computing aspect of that is actually like a micro greenhouse design. And so the students are doing coding and command and control systems within the context of trying to grow food. And that's a big passion project of my colleague, Michael Gao. That's kind of the, the direction Direction that we want to go and where we're looking at food and productivity, but the, the book, The Upcycle, they talk about the designing for abundance, right? It's where you're not just trying to cancel things out, but you're just trying to make things actually better and, and grow. You know, our kids don't really have to think too much about where the food comes from. It's certainly not a financial or uh, for most of them, it's not a it's not a daily concern, but where that food comes from and how it comes to us and what comes to us, I think is a bigger issue that we can kind of engage with with them. So we've got a burgeoning growing kind of agricultural science bent to some of our design stuff, which we're really excited about and looking at the intersection there of how technology and design can kind of make that really happen. And that's really led by, by Michael. That's his kind of passion. And he's got a bit more time than I do as well. So he's geeks out over that stuff. And then we're also looking at the materials we use. We've largely moved away from using acrylic, for example, in our laser cutters, moving more towards uh, cardboard and board, uh, cardstock, just for prototyping, just for anything. Like, unless it kids got a really pressing need that it has to come out of this this plastic and we've kind of directed them towards that we've played around with mycelium which is like a fungal compound that, that mushrooms grow in I'm looking at as a as a mold making material really excited about that we've figured out how to do it with like a small group of like three or four people trying to figure out how we can scale that up to be a material that could be used in an inquiry with you know 90 kids because it's pretty technically it's pretty pretty challenging to work with everybody's got to be 
clean. You got to wear gloves and stuff like that. But that's really where I'd like, if I had my, my druthers, I'd like the name of the de- program to be changed from design to just sort of sustainable design or something where that, that those concepts kind of come into, they're the center of what we're doing. We're taking slow, but sort of deliberate steps in that direction. And that's, that's really exciting. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I remember seeing some pictures of that fungal material. I think you had some up yeah, on, your, on yeah. your Instagram account. It was pretty neat to see you guys were, were successful in that. And that's awesome. Yeah. It's kind of exciting. I mean, there's some people that are doing some really cool stuff in the States. I can't remember her name right now. There's a woman that's doing some really amazing stuff on the, on the East coast there. And she's, She's doing it through a makerspace sort of format, and and it works with that because you. Well, we've done our research. We worked with the Fab Lab in Seoul. One of our teachers, Senya, went up and took some workshops with them. Brought everything back with us. Did a bunch of trial runs, and we've just stopped. We've paused the exploration because we just can't figure out a way to do it with kids that we have to. That's that's where the curricular stuff kind of curricular requirements get in the way of the really cool design stuff. So we're trying to figure that out. You'll figure it out, man. I'm sure. I have no doubt. If I hear anything, I'll let you know. Or if maybe someone's listening has done that and maybe they can yeah. they can help out with that. And so that's yeah, we'd awesome. Love to if anybody's got anything to share. So I hear some things you're excited about, but what are I mean, really, really excited about at the moment? What are some things that you just are so hopeful about the opportunities you might have? We're really proud of our what our students are are doing. I think as our programs evolve and as our teachers have a stronger understanding of what we're teaching and we're more confident with what we're teaching it's what's been really exciting is sort of stepping back and letting the kids kind of take charge of that we've got a couple of kids that have gone on to take their stuff from grade 10 or dp courses and apply for and receive patents uh, for those from the korean government the whatever is the the patent office so you seeing the kids kind of take ownership of of their work and seeing that oh, this is, you know, it doesn't just belong in my classroom. It's, it's not an assignment that I've done, but this is, you know, something that it's part of me. We're really excited about seeing our, seeing our kids kind of go on and, and do that kind of stuff. And like the other thing is, like I was saying, like the smart farming and agriculture stuff, I think that for us as a, as a school and as a department, that can be one thing that we really kind of want to really move towards. It'll be a long journey, I think, but it, I think it's an exciting one, uh, especially where we live because we're surrounded by farms and we're, we're on the, we're in this beautiful place and, and it's somewhat temperate. <laughs> so yeah, yeah I've been there when it wasn't quite so temperate. It came in the, the winter, I think, right? I, at the very end of the winter, it was pretty gray and, yeah. and pretty cold. Gray wind and no sun. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's, that's the worst time. <laughs> yeah. It was a little bit like the service of the moon I yeah. when I was there. <laughs> Those gray winter winds there, there, they can knock it out of you. Awesome. So you mentioned the upcycle. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Oh, yeah. So uh, you guys, some of you might be familiar with the Cradle to Cradle book, and it was written by these two guys, uh, William McDonough and Michael, how do you say it? Is it Brongata? Brongata? Bromgart. Yeah, Bromgart. And that's just looking at the idea of the first book, Cradle to Cradle, just looks at the idea of like things being produced and it's a sort of like a circular economy kind of idea. And uh, that was a really good book to sort of introduce the ideas to me. And then most, actually most of our team has also gotten into that book as well. And then a few years ago, we, we got into our library, the, the Upcycle, which I actually enjoy, I, I like this one more because it's, it's written, I think about a decade or so afterwards. It's a bit of a reflective, part of it is reflective in terms of like what, what were the concepts they were trying to get through. But it also, when they introduced the concept of cradle to cradle, it was relatively new. Here they include a ton of examples of how the, the, that concept was then applied to all these different kind of contexts and situations. And I just found it really inspiring. And that's really what got me thinking about, well, what would be the upcycling that would happen in a, in a design department, right? Like what within the system that, I mean, we produce kids and we produce designers and we produce those thinkers. What does that look like and how could we do that in a, in a sustainable way? And it's just been really inspiring, I guess, from, from that perspective. Our grade 12 girls, and actually this is something you guys might want to check out, is there's the Cradle to Cradle Institute, the C2C Institute. You can do a quick search for it. They have an online course and certification to be a, a C2C designer. Designer. It's free. 
much of the course content in that online course aligns with the DP design technology topic two, which is resources and sustainability and topic eight, which is just sustainability. So I actually have the kids just, just do the course. They do the course first, and then we go back and look at the actual IB topics and make the connections there because the course is done, I think, really well. The test is really easy. <laughs> so everybody graduates, everybody gets their certificate, but the kids are quite, they're quite chuffed that, you know, they can go through this. For many of them, it's their first chance and it's, it's kind of a new concept and they get the certification and stuff. And it's not just certification to be a designer, but you know, one of our girls that was in the DP course, she wrote about that in her application letter to an economics program, just saying like, this is how you need to think as an economist. You need to think what's the best way to solve these problems. And she referred to that course and actually talked about that course that she'd taken in design. And so now I see that and I was like, yep, that's why you should be taking design. Like you might go and make stuff, but if you go and make policy, it's, it's going to have the same impact or even more impact. So that's awesome, man. I always get so inspired talking to you, Aiden. I know we can do this all day. So you've yeah. got a website. Can you tell us a little bit about that? The website's called Design and Inquiry. It's it's a big evolved into a big giant Google site. It's basically MYP and DP resources. At the beginning of my DP teaching, I really struggled to kind of find things, and there was a, I wasn't really connected too much with the, the DP design world, so I didn't know who was who or who to reach out to and stuff. And I had some resources that were left to me by the previous teacher, and I just started to kind of build from that. One of the big thing is that I'm really focused on right now is the case studies because I want to try and support my DP girls for their exams, which are built around case studies. So I've been looking at the past papers, seeing how the questions are structured and just trying to find case studies that teach the content uh, through through a case study there. And then using that as just uh, exam practice and stuff. And that's been uh, actually really fun. I kind of enjoy writing the case studies because I'm a bit of a geek that way. But the girls, I think before I was taking more of a really kind of like let's teach topic one and let's go topic two. And I, I didn't know the content well enough to sort of play around and move around with it. But now I can go to this case study and we actually kind of go through the case studies rather than the content and that way. And I find that that's making deeper connections and that's been really good. Yeah. So it's really just a repository of all the, the teaching resources that we use in the course. And I decided to make it public because, you know, I've been teaching for a while and I've always benefited from other people sharing, sharing stuff, I'm not saying mine is the, <laughs> the be all and the end all, but it's, it's, you know, if you were like me, just starting out or you just need a fresh perspective on how to approach things. And I've always found it incredibly useful to just, you know, be online or be communicating with other people and seeing how they do it. Because at the end of the day, you can't really teach somebody else's content. But as long as you've got, you're seeing how other people can do it, it kind of in, informs how you can do it. Absolutely. I think we, everyone who's listening, who's taught anything has been in that position before <laughs> where they didn't have enough, enough stuff to draw upon. And so yeah. I know that your stuff is high quality, man. I appreciate you sharing that with everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Happy to do it. So everybody always benefits from that. Agreed. Totally agree. So Aiden, if folks want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do that? Best way is probably on Twitter. I get too many emails from students, so I tend to ignore email really <laughs> Quite a bit. So you can get me at Sogum, S-O-G-H-U-M. It's Korean for salt, which is a very long reference to my pre-ceramic days as a salt glazed potter, I guess. So. Uh, I thought you were just a salty dude. All right, man. I thought you were like <laughs> <laughs> hardened by the sea air. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny, yeah. man. Well, Aiden, really, I appreciate yeah. it very much. And I want to I want to update yeah, folks later you. about all the things you guys have been doing. Maybe we can maybe we can do something when you are doing wind the, turbine. Wind turbine. You knew what I was talking about, man. Yeah. Maybe yeah, we yeah. can do some live streaming or something. That would be really cool. Oh, you know, to, that would be really cool. Yeah. yeah. To, to share yeah. that. So maybe we can set something up. I would love to. I'm sure everyone who's ever seen it has, has loved it and raved about it. So I'd love to do yeah. something with that sometime. So you guys do that in the spring. Is that about right? Oh, uh, geez. Uh, all the dates have been thrown 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 up up in the air i think we're looking at doing it in uh late february or march but we're not uh, I, I, it's flexible i'll keep in touch yeah. and maybe we can I'll tweet something. that would be yeah. pretty sweet all right cool yeah. thank you so much aiden i hope you enjoyed that episode of design cast i'm jason your host and i produced and created this podcast if you have any input i would love to hear from you and i look forward to seeing you again really soon this podcast is a proud member of the teach better podcast network better today better tomorrow and the podcast to get you there Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. We will see you on the next episode.
Oh, 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 oh,